Sometimes the only way to make sense of our world is by asking questions. Why is the sky blue? How can I be allergic to pollen? What if I played Skyrim on legendary difficulty but only ever leveled up the speech skill? Meet Richard the Rich, a man who laughed in the face of nominative determinism. Richard dreamed of one day owning a manor in solitude. The only thing standing in his way was his total lack of both money and talent. Looking for work? A trustworthy looking man in the tavern asked Richard to acquire some paperwork about a horse. The only person who knew where this paperwork was was currently imprisoned. Hey, you're not supposed to be down here. Richard was unable to persuade the Warden to let him speak to the prisoner, so had to abandon the mission entirely. A Scottish man negged Richard for being poor and asked him to commit crime. Richard politely declined. He didn't know how to pick locks or pockets and had no interest in learning how. Richard wandered into the sewers beneath Riften, dodging the attacks of criminals and lowlifes, wondering whether the Thieves' Guild would just accept him if he turned up on the doorstep. The reception he received at the Ragged Flagon was colder than a Tango Ice Blast, but not nearly as sweet. After sprinting out of the Ratway, Richard tried a local alchemist shop to see if they had any work. The job was simple and required no skill. Walk to Shorestone, collect an ore sample, bring it back. The road was more treacherous than expected and Richard had to dodge arrows shot by bandits. He arrived in town with a pack of wolves hot on his tail. While modern cultures might frown on the idea of leading a pack of hungry predators into town, in Skyrim it is a gesture of respect. On the way back from Shaw's Stone, Richard accosted an elf who told him he was looking kinda sus, vicious, and asked him to retrieve his family's lost bow. Everybody seems to have problems, thought Richard. I'm gonna monetize them. The alchemist thanked Richard for his job retrieving the ore and paid him in potions, which he promptly sold back to her for less than market value. It was now time to run screaming through the ratways beneath Riften in search of the missing bow. Unfortunately, it was being stored in a locked chest, so Richard couldn't complete that quest either. There are some problems that can't be solved by buying and selling things in a shop. After encountering a woman who was in the process of turning into a stack of crates, Richard decided to leave Riften forever, so he did. He stopped by Shaw Stone again and a woman asked if he was headed to Darkwater Crossing. She handed him a satchel full of letters and so his life as a courier began. On the way, Richard encountered a guard tower, the residents of which had all been brutally killed. I wonder if their families know they're dead, he wondered as he stripped them of their material possessions. At Darkwater Crossing, he handed over the satchel of letters and instead of payment was given another satchel to deliver back to Shorestone. More like, sure seems like a lot of stuff needs to be delivered there, Stone, he joked. Reeling from almost fatal embarrassment, he began the journey back to Shorestone. Every cloud has a silver lining, however, and this lining was shaped like a horse. Richard affectionately nicknamed it Pringles, because once you pop on Pringles, you can't stop on Pringles. Pringles was an incredible horse, and Richard had a great time roaming around the countryside, running away from wolves, watching Pringles beat up the wolves. Pringles even took him all the way back to Shorestone so he could be paid with a borderline worthless ring. That magical horse was even there when Richard first leveled up the speech skill. The Khajiit merchant didn't ask where Richard had found three complete sets of Rift and Guard armor, and that was why Richard liked dealing with the Khajiit. It was a great day, but it was also a bittersweet day. As Richard rode Pringles to Windhelm, he knew that the two would eventually need to part. Horses were not allowed within the city walls, and Richard knew that Pringles, when dismounted, would wander off to the random point in the wilderness where he first found him. In just 24 hours, Richard had made his first friend, bonded with that first friend, and learned how to say goodbye. Still though, Richard had a funny feeling that he and Pringles would meet again. I mean, he was wrong, but you know... He Windhelm was a bustling city with plenty of opportunities to make some money. This shopkeeper had inadvertently purchased a stolen ring and hired Richard to return it to the rightful owner in secret. Sadly, her door was locked, so Richard had no other option but to rat out the shopkeeper to her directly, earning 400 gold. A high elf gentleman hired Richard to track down something called the White File. It was apparently located in a cave not too far from Windhelm. How exciting, thought Richard, an opportunity to delve into a mysterious old cave 
That's not the kind of thing you do every day. If you did that every day, you'd start to get bored of it. He had a little sleep in a local tavern with apparently most of the town, and then off he popped on his merry way, keen to prove that with the power of speech alone, he would retrieve the white file. Since he wasn't allowed to use any weapons, Richard had developed a new strategy. He learned that if you run into a room, grab everything valuable, and then run out as quickly as you can, enemies often don't have time to kill you. It was fortunate that he had learned this strategy, because the home of the White File was riddled with the undead. As monstrous, unfeeling corpses attacked him from all sides, Richard felt as though he'd wandered onto Guildford High Street clutching a petition to ban fox hunting. He eventually found himself in the main chamber, which he sprinted through to find the White File hidden away. As he made his daring escape, dodging arrows and ducking under axes, Richard remarked that avoiding combat in Skyrim was more thrilling than engaging in it. Through sheer force of will, he had located the white file, retrieved it, and escaped with his life. He was given five gold for his troubles. I trust you can show yourself out. Thankfully, an employee of the aging quest giver understood inflation and paid the rest of the fee. It seemed that the older generations in Skyrim didn't understand how prohibitively expensive it was to buy property these days. Later that day, Richard was approached by a member of the East Empire Company. They were having trouble with pirates, so they asked Richard to engage in corporate espionage and steal a logbook from one of their local competitors. I'm sure we can all agree that it is unacceptable to steal from your competitors. However, they were working with pirates. Richard's employer sent him to Dawnstar to get some more information from the pirates themselves. One of the pirates sold out his organisation for the mere price of 48 gold. This is why I personally left the piracy profession. Too many snitches, not enough bits of respect for the pirate code. In the process of bribing the brigand, Richard did level up his speech skill, which was nice. As he tried to leave Dawnstar, our hero was set upon by a group of hired thugs. He ran towards the guards who refused to get involved and ran away. Since law enforcement had failed him, Richard went for plan B and lured the thugs towards a giant encampment. These mercenaries had fee fi fo f***ed around and were about to fee fi fo find out. A note on one of the corpses revealed that they had been hired by somebody called Nils who lived in Windhelm. Richard did not have time to contemplate how he had wronged this person he'd never met because he was busy running for his life from a giant. The experience of fleeing in panic from the giant while its heavy footsteps thundered behind Richard was actually quite thrilling. Arguably more thrilling than it would have been to fight said giant. Richard headed back to Windhelm to have a word with Nils about the impermanence of life. Strangely, it seemed he had vanished without a trace. Richard was worried that anybody in Skyrim could take offence at his existence and decided to hire some muscle. For a mere 500 gold, a man named Stenvar agreed to follow Richard wherever he went, forever. Companions in Skyrim are in desperate need of a union. With his new bodyguard in tow, Richard returned to the East Empire Company. They told him it was time to take out the pirates once and for all. Of course, said Richard, I will help you with that. My companion will do the fighting, and I will sell the things that we loot. No, my employee will not receive a cut of the sales, are you mad? While we watch Stenvar kill all of these bandits, I'd like to talk to you about something very important. Did you know that of the people who watch my videos, about 15% of them are subscribed? Pretty sick, right? That's actually not bad. If you're not one of those people, I have a business proposition for you. Here's what you need to do. Click that subscribe button. It will make me feel really good and it will make my numbers go up. In exchange, you will receive absolutely nothing. Thank you for your time. As the last pirate's body was swept away by the ocean's torrents, Richard received fair payment of 500 gold for a job well done. Despite all of Richard's hard work, however, he was still a long way off from the 25,000 gold he needed to buy the property in solitude. He led Stenvar to a nearby cave to collect the bounty on a local bandit leader. It was becoming clear that Stenvar was a master of both conventional I'll rip you in half. and unconventional schools of combat. Some critics might suggest that Richard was not pulling his weight in this cave, but I would stress that he was undertaking the manual labour of stripping the corpses and selling their belongings. He also spared Stenvar the mental labour of counting all of the gold that he made. By the time he'd finished selling all of the bandit's belongings, Richard finally levelled up. Thanks to his dedication to the speech skill, he was now able to haggle for slightly better prices in shops. 
That's probably just a starter perk, I'm sure the later ones are much better. Sadly, while Richard and Stenvar had been away, disaster had struck in Windhelm. A serial killer was on the loose, and since podcasts hadn't been invented yet, it fell to Richard and Stenvar to find the culprit. After checking the victim's pockets for clues, Richard followed a trail of blood to a nearby house. The door was locked, so he needed to get the key from the parents of its former occupant, who had also recently been murdered. You need to leave. Both of you. Out! Out! He wasn't quite sure what to make you of the two of them. Richard didn't find anything particularly noteworthy in the house, but he did find a nice new hat. While the killer's trail may have gone cold, the same could not be said of Richard's ears. Having completely run out of ideas, Richard accused the town wizard of being behind the crimes. It made sense, the wizard's name was Woundfirth the Unliving, so maybe he'd been going around unliving everyone. You're under the arrest for the murder of Susanna of Candlehath Hall. Case closed. Richard was only about 50% confident that he'd caught the right guy, so he decided it was time to make a move. En route to Dawnstar, he encountered a man who told him the best place to learn about speechcraft was the Bard's College in Solitude. Richard was sure he would be able to learn all sorts of cool speechcraft-related skills there. There might even be some speech-related quests. Richard's delusional optimism was cut short when the ice snakes attacked. These slippery serpents were too difficult for even Stenvar to overcome. Ever the resourceful thinker, Richard led the serpents towards a bandit fort. There were like ten bandits in there, so he was pretty sure the ice snakes would be defeated. They weren't though, so it was time for plan B. If you're ever facing insurmountable odds, try luring your opponent towards a giant. Works every time. The road from Dawnstar to Solitude was littered with random encounters. The random nature of these encounters made them more interesting. They were interesting encounters. They made Skyrim feel like a dynamic setting where anything was possible. Further down the road, Richard encountered some miners. There were some pretty revolutionary ideas floating around inside that hut, but thankfully it wasn't Richard's business. In both senses, because uh, it, it didn't, it wasn't important to him, and also he didn't own the mine. Because, like, it, it, it's not his business, is what I'm saying. Do you see what I mean? Because he doesn't, he doesn't own it, so it's not, they're not his employees. Y you get it? No, we'll leave it in, they'll get it. Just edit some fighting under it or something. The city of solitude towered over the horizon. Its ancient walls seemed to whisper to the surrounding countryside. Living here is expensive. Further down the road, Richard encountered a dog. What's that, boy? Your former owner died penniless and alone in a shack in the woods? Outstanding. You're coming with me. The dog's name was Miko, and he was a very, very, very good boy. Richard was surprised to see a Thalmor elf fall from the sky. The alleged elf master race had apparently failed to grasp the basics of gravity. They also didn't notice that their prisoner was being killed by a mud crab. Crabs won. Fascists nil. When the people of Solitude saw a newcomer approaching, they began the traditional ritual of beheading one of their own citizens. Richard made a joke about how this would negatively impact property prices, but nobody got it, they just agreed with him. Richard nipped into the local clothes shop. The shopkeeper spoke with the stunted cadence of an actor who knew her line, but didn't understand it. It is when my customers waste time chatting and not buying. Richard was now dressed for the job he wanted. Owner of property. Proud Spire Manor was on the market, but Richard had less than half of what he'd need to buy it. Well, I've got a shipment of spices the East Empire Company is holding up. I need someone to convince them to release it. Did she just say convince? At long last, it was time for Richard to use his powers of speech to successfully complete a quest. He tried using his powers of persuasion to convince Vittoria Vici to release the shipment. When that didn't work, he bribed her. What a nasty piece of work, Richard thought. I hope somebody assassinates her at her wedding, ideally when she's giving a speech on the balcony. Richard and Stenvar retired to a local inn, where a bard was singing an unfamiliar song and staring into Stenvar's soul. The next day, Richard reported to the Bard's College. As an initiation, they asked him to find the remains of a missing poem. Cool, said Richard. Do I need to persuade somebody to give it to me? Maybe interview some different bards to see which parts of the poem they can remember? Of course not, said the Bard's College. You need to go into a cave filled with the undead. It's in a cave full of the undead, obviously. En route to the aforementioned cave filled with the undead, Richard encountered some bandits who were dressed in soldiers' uniforms. They were imposters, but there's nothing funny about that. Among assorted weapons and armor, Richard found a few pieces he could sell back in town. 
As the bards had predicted, Dead Man's respite was full of the undead. Not wanting to steal the limelight, Richard locked Stenvar in with some of them. He didn't want to get in the way. To his credit, Richard did deactivate a trap at one point. This was, after all, a team effort. Richard recovered the poem and regrouped with Stenvar and Miko, who had teamed up with a blue ghost. In the main chamber of the tomb, a thrilling boss battle occurred, and Richard could barely contain his excitement as he stood in place watching. After stealing King Olaf's treasure, he headed back to solitude. Sadly, it seemed the poem was incomplete, so they had to wing it slightly. You have proven your point, Viarmo. Now that the poem had been restored, the Bard's College were allowed to burn an effigy of King Olaf. Here's what the onlookers had to say. So nice to get this break from my cleaning duties. I like the pretty lights. Burn, burn the, the king. king! Based. A shady-looking lizard told Richard that if he doused the fire at Solitude Lighthouse, there were riches untold to be had. Yes, some sailors might crash and drown. Maybe they should build their own lighthouse. Is it the duty of the state to build lighthouses for every citizen? Near the lighthouse, Richard met some pirates. They weren't the friendliest bunch, but they did have a very unusual gem. I must remember to take this gem to an appraiser, thought Richard. This is Chekhov's gem. After extinguishing the fire at the lighthouse, Richard returned to Solitude to sell a few possessions that he'd pilfered. It was time to level up once more. Despite dedicating his entire life to speech, Richard's skill was too low to gain any of the secondary perks, so he had to get a haggling bonus. Again. Richard went to meet the lizards at the pre-agreed meeting spot. It was a ship that had crashed, and for unrelated reasons, all of the crew members had died. They had also picked their own pockets and emptied all the cupboards of valuables. To everybody's surprise, the lizards betrayed Richard and tried to kill him. He could not believe that once again his quests were ending in forced violence. There was no option to talk his way out of combat, because why would there be? Why would that be something that somebody would want to do? Who could have predicted that this would be something somebody would want to do? Richard led Stenvar to Broken Ore Grotto and insisted that he exact revenge on the lizards and all their associates. A lot of people died that day, and death is this funny thing where everything you could have been, every possibility that lies before you is just taken from you in one fell swoop. It sometimes feels like the only reason we're alive is so that we can fear death and respond in kind. Are all of our actions not to some extent driven by this desire to achieve or something leave something behind? Are we all just screaming into an uncaring universe, desperately pleading for someone to notice that we exist? Stenvar got a new sword, and Richard made a good amount of money by looting all of the corpses and selling the loot for profit. Richard knew that he needed to get into the aristocracy's good books in order to buy property in solitude, so he offered to check out some mysterious goings-on at a nearby cave. Fortunately, the cave was full of wizards. Wizards were excellent business for Richard. Their clothes were worth quite a lot of money, and they didn't weigh very much, so you could carry a staggering amount of wizards' clothes around before you needed to head back to town. All these wizards are out here trying to turn lead into gold when the real gold was in their clothes the whole time. What a cool looking magical ritual. I wonder what these wizards are up to. Oh, it's, it's the undead. They're raising the dead. The dead have risen. Again. These wizards did have a few tricks up their sleeves though. One dead wizard that Richard had already stripped of all of its clothes and possessions rose from the dead and attempted to kill him. These wizards also knew healing magic, which is cheating and not fair. The thing is though, Stenvar was kind of unstoppable. He had an almost heroic quality to him. With the ritual disrupted and the robes sold, Richard once again found himself searching for something to do. It was starting to feel like he was living in Stenvar's shadow. The Jarl of Solitude asked Richard to take her husband's old horn and place it at the Shrine of Talos near Whiterun. On the way, he met a hilarious clown, the funniest guy in all the land. After telling Richard what his favourite country song was, Wagon wheel. This adorable little goon asked Richard if he could enlist the help of a local farmer to fix the stuck cart. Say no more, said Richard, I have an approximately 50% success rate at this sort of thing. After successfully persuading the farmer to help the little clown out, Richard went back to tell him the good news. It was the easiest 250 gold he had ever made. Later that day, Richard arrived at the Shrine of Talos. He helped himself to a few things that were lying on the altar and replaced them with the horn belonging to the Jarl's late husband. It was at this moment that he realised he could have just tossed the horn in a ditch and told the Jarl that he'd done it. It would have saved quite a lot of time. 
Or he could have used his mastery of the speech skill to lie and say that he'd done it when in fact he'd kept the horn for himself or sold it. Surely that's an option. Surely, in a world with a speech skill, you could use it to lie to people. Think of all the possibilities that would open up in a world where you could lie to people about whether or not you completed quests and the interesting developments that could occur if you had in fact lied to the wrong person. Anyway, the Jarl was very thankful and said that Richard had earned the right to purchase property. Not the capital, but the right. The next few days were filled with what can only be described as aimless wandering. Richard, Stenvar and Miko went to a cave full of vampires and Stenvar killed them and Richard sold their clothes. Then they went to a cave infested with Falmer and Stenvar killed them all and Richard took all their stuff and sold it. And you won't believe what happened at the big bandit fort. Richard couldn't shake the feeling that he was becoming a passenger in someone else's life. He had dedicated his life to the speech skill, and it had got him nowhere. On a whim, Richard made the decision to go and check out a place called Helgen. They made this mead there with juniper berries in it, apparently it was sick. On the way to Helgen, he impulsively freed an Imperial prisoner. The soldiers who were leading the prisoner lit their torches up in unison, which was quite cool, but they died nonetheless. Stenvar made sure of that. As the group finally approached Helgen, Richard saw a dragon fly away into the sky. By the eight divines, he gasped. Imagine what this is going to do to the economy. Helgen had been burned to the ground. Richard wanted to head back to Solitude, but Stenvar insisted that they go and warn the local town of Riverwood. Fine, we'll warn the villagers, then we can go clear out one last tomb, that Bleak Falls Barrow place. We'll go there, we'll clear it out, we'll make some money. End of. Back to Solitude. One last tomb. One last time, then we're done with this, Stenvar. I am retiring. Within Bleak Falls Barrow, they found a golden claw that opened a magical door, and on the other side of that magical door was a coffin with an old dead guy in it. And that dead guy had this sort of tablet that had a map on it to a bunch of old dragon burial sites. It was way more than Richard had signed up for. They travelled to Whiterun. Richard wanted to sell some things, and Stenvar wanted to warn the Jarl about the dragons. It felt like the end of something. Like that funny feeling you get that things are going to be different from now on. Richard leveled up again and got the ability to get better prices from vendors with extra steps. The Jarl of Whiterun thanked Stenvar for warning the people about the dragon. And the wizard thanked Stenvar for retrieving the map of dragon burial sites. Apparently he was going to ask someone to do that and whoop de doo Stenvar had done it. Hooray. Celebrations of Stenvar's brilliance were cut short by the news that a dragon was attacking Whiterun. This is it, said Richard. I need about a thousand more gold before I can buy my manor. One last job, Stenvar. Me and you. I need you to kill something for me one last time. As Richard saw the dragon descending from the mountains, he knew this had to be the last time. Under his watch, Stenvar had begun to grow into something bigger than before. And when that dragon died, and when Stenvar absorbed its soul, Richard knew it was time for the two of them to part ways. As Richard approached Stenvar, his stalwart companion said the only thing that needed to be said. You're letting me go? What's wrong? Is my skill with a blade making you look bad? <laughs> I'm kidding, friend. Until we meet again. And that was it. Richard went back to Solitude and sold the dragon bones, making just enough money to buy Proud Spire Manor. He had done it. Without levelling up any skill other than speech, he had purchased the most expensive property in Skyrim. And by all accounts, he was a happy man, content and secure in his new home. There is a moral to this story. If you really want something, like really, really want it, you've just got to assume it's going to happen and rely on other people to do the legwork for you.